Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to make one outrageous claim. I think I'm the oldest in the room, um, particularly when you list, listen to that list of things which it has been my, well, I will say, uh, it has been my privilege to report because I think being a journalist is a privilege. It's yes. a fantastic job. It's a fantastic world we have around us. And what you, we, I have to do is just say what it's like. What a fantastic job. I'm still an optimist about journalist, journalism. Um, as well as being the oldest in the room, I'm not going to make the claim I've been shot at more than other people. That would be probably just my fault for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because we don't go to conflicts in order to be part of them and become the story. On the other hand, I've just made a lot of mistakes and ended up um, you know, being on the wrong end of things. But what gives me hope? is seeing so many young journalists around here today because we have got to look at the future. Many years ago, I, I have addressed um, a good number of conventions and conferences around Europe. And usually, when we were speaking there in those times, we used to talk about freedom of the press and bang on about the rest of the world. They were the people who had to catch us up they were the ones with the dictators. They were the ones who hadn't woken up to the idea of the freedom of the press. Today, we're looking at Europe. And I feel it's a personal view, but I hear quite a bit of what I'm thinking reiterated this morning. We are in a deteriorating situation in Europe. We have got to look to our laurels, our laurels being a wonderful history and tradition of democracy and a long tradition of journalism, and it is being threatened on many sides. I'm old enough to have grown up in a house in the northeast of England full of mementos of war, uh, not medals of, or photographs of soldiers, but bomb shrapnel embedded in our furniture uh, from a 2,000 pounder which hit our greenhouse. I grew up believing that our greenhouse and its tomatoes were a vital target for bombers. I also grew up aware that my parents during that war knew only the official and limited version of events for over five years. Um, they learned much more in the years that followed, but they had accepted secrecy and censorship imposed by a dem democratic government because theirs was a war of national survival. World War II. Europe saw two such wars in the last century, and when nations find their very existence threatened, the press joins up, just like a soldier. It's conscripted, the government will make certain it is, and the people, your audience, are also in agreement. You're all together. Now, a war of national survival is probably the hardest war for any independent-minded journalist to report. But I have to say, Europe has seen two of those wars in the last century. But since then, most wars have been other people's wars, or wars in which your army has got involved through NATO or some military alliance. And those wars are not subject to that major dilemma about, well, let's call it patriotism, because that's what it is. Afghanistan, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, former Yugoslavia, admittedly difficult for those there. I remember talking to this journalist in Sarajevo saying, we don't do the whole truth because the enemy will learn our weaknesses. Totally understandable, all journalists learn that in a war of what is seen as survival. But most of the wars we're talking about are wars in which we should be taking an independent stance and reporting everything we see. And above all, because all conflicts hold significance, because wars change lives. And it's vital not to forget that it's the duty of a democratic press to report them. And I mean that in all the seriousness that the word duty has. And I say it because I think this duty is under stress, and there's considerably contempor considerable contemporary threats to reporting both on the battlefield, and I know that is very much the subject of what is being talked about here, but also back in the newsrooms, on the home front. And this is where I am really worried. 
My views are those of a citizen, a journalist, in a democratic country which has long had a free press, and which has many important media organizations without political affiliation. But we're all feeling the wind of change blowing through our profession, and it's not just the technological advances. As journalists, we tend to concentrate on the physical threats and problems, access, safety, guidelines, equipment. However, we seem to have moved into a world where our very reporting is viewed as questionable. And I'd like to address this, as there is no point whatsoever in going off to war if no one is going to take notice of or trust what you report. Democracies flourish with a free press and democracies expect and tolerate bad news as well as good news about others and about ourselves. Our democracies in Europe are being tested. Extremes of political view alien to democratic values fracturing of old political allegiances to traditional parties, several wars on the fringes of Europe of intense, sometimes baffling complexity, and, of course, a surge of terrorism within Europe. Added to this is the challenge of instant communication and the chatter of social media. For many young people, news means three brief headlines one of which is a football result. And then there is the economy of the internet, targeting users and garnering advertising revenue from sites which delight in fiction, fantasy, and newsy gossip, calling themselves the news, which is undermining expensive, well-rehearsed journalism. There is also the increasing reach of TV stations by satellite, whose content is financed and controlled by non-democratic regimes. Time and again, I hear that the only well-paid jobs in newsrooms are those under the directions of the Russian state, the Iranian government, the Chinese government, the Turkish president, and the various sheikdoms of the Arab Gulf. They're neither democratic, nor do they tolerate opposition to the state. And lastly, and I have to say this, the president of the largest dem democracy, which is a member of NATO, Mr. Trump, is on the record for saying the press are our enemy. Horrendous, disgraceful, and also a beacon of hope to those dictators everywhere who would want to restrict their own press. It is a horrific situation. Cheer up. Most of us are still democracies. And I live in hope for the others. We reporters in democracy still have our fundamental aims to speak truth to power and to report. Both of those aims are tested when reporting conflict. There are the physical threats, and quite properly, we need to discuss aspects of safety, ethical guidelines, status in conflict areas, equipment, and identification. And sometimes today, I think, we concentrate on the physical threats at the cost of the discussion on the wider problems of journalism called in my view, the home front, as opposed to the foreign field or battlefield. There is no point, I'm going to re absolutely reiterate this, because there is no point in risking your lives and discussing how you can ameliorate that risk if trust in your words is lacking and you can't report all you have seen at home. There is no point. We have to sort out the home front. Much has been made of the phrase fake news. There are many definitions. Stories that are pure fantasy, others maliciously manufactured. Truthyism, terrible word. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy <laughs> theories. Public relations gloss, which omits awkward facts. The ludicrous claim that 
alternative facts exist. And here goes the interesting fake news cited by President Trump. I can describe that in one sentence. It means anything he doesn't like. And that is specifically his definition. You might sigh as a journalist saying, we've heard all this before, a myriad cloud of lies. However, what we're facing now is considered by many of our audiences to be the norm. All politicians lie. Oh, the press don't tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. What's a fact anyway? Mm -hmm. These are not just the mutterings of the disaffected. It's become more mainstream. And it's even been suggested by an eminent philosopher in Britain that what we need is a general theory of bullshit. <laughs> Today's problems partly stem from the fact that some leaders, influential individuals, enemies of science, deniers of history, and even some governments are beginning to take up these hitherto discredited so-called post-truth arguments and in doing so undermine the public's trust in journalism. And again, what's the point of reporting from hazardous situations, risking your life if it's met with, I don't believe it, Twitter and YouTube say differently. Mm -hmm. Some practical suggestions. We need to have newsrooms with a firm commitment to sticking to the facts, more resources to research and confirm stories, and a robust effort to debunk and expose that which is untrue and invented. If we're determined to report a riot, then we should be equally determined to take down someone's mischievous report that it has not happened. We need to stand by our interviews, slap down invented quotes on the internet. We need to research and confirm statistic, not repeat fluffy assertions from any old source. This is time consuming, it's expensive, but it is our insurance and our defense. And it also applies to conflict and particularly with regard to video. When ever again is trotted out the word, well, I saw it on the television, it must be true. i give you an example. A couple of years ago, a BBC editor was watching another British TV channel late at night when he spotted footage described as recent pictures from the Syrian city of Aleppo. Images of a much damaged street with clouds of dust from shell fire appeared. A small white vehicle scuttled through heaps of stones. He rang the TV channel and they said they'd got the pictures from a Syrian source who'd previously provided footage. Interesting, said the BBC man. Actually, it's me and Kate Adie in our BBC wagon in Sarajevo in 1993. <laughs> that can happen. And it does more frequently than we care to think. Anyone now can make a video. Certain feature films of war are being happily plundered for material. Vigilance is everything. But so is the willingness to kill the fake footage. At that incident in the BBC, the other channel immediately took down the footage. Try doing that on the internet. Basically, your audience needs to trust your words, your pictures, your accuracy, and your integrity. They matter. Another newsroom challenge is the increasing competition, and this applies very much to conflict, for bloody, gory, grisly pictures. This is a race run every one, every time these days on the internet, especially as we've seen by the outrages of Islamic State. How does this fakery and sadistic footage continue to appear? One of the reasons is 
that the large social networks operating worldwide, with the exception of China, are mainly from American companies. They're based on a legal definition decided some few years ago of a very free version of free speech, much freer than many European countries. The Americans, shall we say, are much more relaxed about violence compared to attitudes regarding sexual images. And the internet platforms have gone into the news business. And no one has yet managed to get these huge, octopus-like corporations, ever growing richer, to behave as publishers with all the accepted checks and balance and legal constraints that have been democratically discussed and accepted. All that's on offer from these mega rich and increasingly powerful organizations is a small number of so-called moderators to deal with the millions of videos and postings every day. The press is fighting a competitor with no rules. We need to address that. We need to go on the attack. We need to campaign about this. Many journalists find it difficult to criticize other press and media outlets professionally. Okay, from the political point of view, there will always be difficult, different political views. But this time we're saying, stop, your facts are wrong. Your footage is fake. You have invented statements and events. I think we should do much, much more to counter these lies with more facts supported by evidence and publicly sourced research. You can't call a fish tank clean until the water is clear. In conflict reporting, almost everything is contested. We all know that for obvious reasons. And many governments and the general public have been slow to recognize that technology has provided a more even battlefield for the world's media. For much of the 20th century, many people who wished to protest or dislodge a regime or overturn a government did not have access to the latest equipment, the ability to spread their message in the media and reach the general public. That was until about the mid-1990s. Now it's different. Every street fighter has access to the World Wide Web. The answer, though, is not more censorship or legal prohibitions. It's the need to improve honest journalism, counter the false news, and also question the politicians on your home territory who have a lingering dislike of a free and critical press but who should recognize that it's a necessary element of a free and democratic society. If journalism doesn't flourish freely on the home front, it's useless on the battlefield. That's the third time I have said that. <laughs> I have to make it clear to you that I think there's another battle to be fought, and it's not on the battlefield. It is on our home front. <laughs> The second frequently heard criticism of journalists covering conflict these days is you don't show us the full story. Well, we know that. But the implication now is that the full story, the real story, is the really grisly stuff on the net. That this is not shown on conventional channels, channels is due to the deliberations and decisions about the acceptability of on-screen violence, with which we're all familiar. But the implication is that the internet, in showing more violent pictures, is actually delivering the real story. Add to this the availability of footage on well-funded satellite stations and the international reach, which are subject to control and interference by governments, and which have a political interest in one side of conflict, the viewer is beginning to feel cheated. I've listened to a lot of people in Britain who now have access to and can download very easily internet channels, 24-hour news, from stations not based in UK or America. And they say 
We've seen pictures from Ukraine of American special forces. BBC doesn't tell us that. Mm -hmm. RT has a lot to answer for. I make no bones about it. But you won't be alone, RT, in the future. Lots of nations are acquiring 24-hour news for their own use. And the people that are in conflict will be seeing two versions of a story in a way not encountered in the two world wars that were fought last century. And we have to be able to deal with it. So what do we do when we have a war to cover? Above everything, get your eyewitnesses. On the spot reporting is the basis of verification. When I began working as a correspondent, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, almost the only way to get pictures and the story back to base in London was to get there yourself. British TV news, BBC and ITN had enviable resources compared to many of our fellow Europeans, though we were usually outgunned, I have to say, by the very well-resourced Americans. By the late 80s, we were able to transmit via small mobile dishes, and teams of camera, engineer, producer, and reporter were common at all major events. By the mid-90s, the agency networks had arrived. Local camera crews took over, transmitting from their own dishes, speaking the language, knowing the contacts. It became so much quicker to take in Reuters or APTV, and so much cheaper. The habit of sending your own people has come to depend very much on how much national interest is involved at home. And another consequence of the agency or freelance camera, familiar with the territory, knows the language, is that the vast majority of conflict footage that is shown all over Europe today is shot by freelancers, and often without a reporter present, just pictures. Cheap and you put the voice on at home. What's missing now is the reporter's eyewitness detail, the questioning of local people, information gained from watching, sensing the atmosphere, listening to the stories, the rumors, the propaganda, being able to sift the truth on the spot. I don't really have to say this in front of all of these professionals, but I think we have to remind ourselves of the importance that, especially in conflict, pictures do not tell you enough. Today, there is less money around. Insurance and safety legislation, especially in Europe, are also more prominent. And then there is a sense, and I'm not sure if this is absolutely true, of increased hostility towards the press. I say I'm not absolutely sure because it is a myth a fairy story that the media have always been tolerated in battle zones. It's been a fight for almost 200 years. Of the first still cameras, taking photographs, the French and the British, arrived in the Crimean War in the 1840s. They wanted to take pictures, Roger Fenton was the famous photographer, of the battlefield. No, said the army, kindly wait until we've tidied it up and placed the cannonballs in artistic positions. They've been at it for years, and in a way they're still at it. There is dislike of having the reporters there to witness the dreadful mess. Indeed. In World War I, a conflict so long and vast, you might think that every journalist was there, the British fret press was met with what became almost the underlying view of the military right through the war. The attitude of the government and the military to the British press in 1914 was a quote from a general who said, why can't you chaps wait until it's all over and then we'll tell you who's won? <laughs> there are, I have no doubt, still generals like that today. There is really, even today, no set pattern to conflict coverage, as journalists, 
you should be heading there yourself. However, even within NATO, countries vary considerably in their tolerance of the media. Decisions are usually in the hands of politicians at home. It also depends largely on whether your own troops are involved. But the key to this is for the media to know or to find out before any conflict and in peacetime just how their government is going to view access and press activity in time of conflict. Don't get to the outbreak of fighting not knowing what your government and military might do to you. Find out, question them. Obviously, some governments these days are nervous of hostage taking, as it may well mean government involvement, however reluctant. Even so, newsrooms ought to have some idea of what they might expect from the politicians. It's a fraught area. As for access, I have the, well, no, it's not a feeling. I've actually always just acted on it. That if I go to any place where there is conflict, I have as much right there as a foreign army. You wouldn't believe the number of armies who don't believe this. They think they own the battlefield. I've actually had it said to me on the spot. You just have to stand your ground and say, no, you're wrong. Okay, they may have the guns and the strength, but you have moral right on your side. You have a duty to witness. There should be no need for permissions to be granted to cover conflict. I'm going to repeat that. No need for permissions to be granted to cover conflict. Conflict involves us all. If you think of the footage of the last year, what are the pictures of? Old ladies, dead children, youngsters running around, desperate, columns of people under shell fire. Military people do not own the battlefield. Journalists should be there because not only the military take part in conflict, the unwilling do as well. And we are there to report on that. This is forgotten by large numbers of military people and also quite a lot of politicians. We as journalists are responsible for our safety as we are elsewhere. We need to keep out of the line of fire, nor should we interfere with military inter operations. But that does not mean that we should be herded around like sheep in a pen. Nor does it mean that we should have to attach ourselves to a particular fighting group. Embedding is, yes, a means of access, but it is always limited. Always. It's a form of military control, frequently leading to limited coverage. And I don't think that a piece of paper, some kind of accreditation, changes a thing. One of the consequences of the accreditation argument is that when you face a thug with an AK-47 who is hostile, possibly semi-literate, and possibly drunk, a feature of an enormous amount of conflicts, rarely reported, mm -hmm. or under the influence of drugs, also rarely reported. Um, that particular thug is not interested in reading your piece of paper. I can't count the number of times that I have realized that pieces of paper are worthless in front of the determined fighter. The other end of the accreditation argument is that it defines you, uh, depending on who has issued the paper. And it may be well that your gun-toting roadblock creature has no time for a particular government or NATO or the UN or even the Red Cross. Respecters of no one. And do not respect those who issue the paper. 
Um, I ha also have to stress that several countries, including my own, have no official accreditation or registration system for journalists. Anyone in Britain can say they're a journalist, and they do. But so far, after two centuries of that system, it kind of works. Let me recommend it to you. When considering today's coverage of conflict, everyone can appreciate the advances in technology. But one other major development is less discussed. Factual reporting obtaining eyewitness evidence is giving way to emotion. Part of it is the influence of the entertainment industry in the visual media. War is now often seen through the prism of suffering and despair and fear and many other feelings, especially in television. The consequences of conflict are, of course, of immense importance. However, they are often now edging out the horror and brutality and determination of war and the way that it is waged. At the same time, as the claim is made because of technology, that we're seeing war live on TV. Mainstream stations, unwilling to compete with the barbarous images to be found on the internet, prefer often to engage audiences with pictures that elicit sympathy and concern rather than the grim realities of fighting and bombing. I'll give you an example that during the second um, Gulf War, pictures were shown all over the internet reported by Western reporters of the bombing of Baghdad. An orange glow on the horizon, which was all the reporters could see from central Baghdad. We're seeing it live on TV. This is war, was the claim. No, you weren't seeing anyone dying, fried alive in the flames. The result of that, that is war. I'm not saying that we should put out the utterly grisly pictures, but to claim that distant shots and quite often only outgoing fire are war is a cop-out, absolutely. And we should be very aware of that. It's not live on TV. This is all a lot of pressure on journalists because I'm arguing we have to see how war is conducted fully and all the people involved, not just the military. And with developments of drones and long-range artillery and above-the-clouds bombers, again, the machinery and killing of war is avoided. And often, because of the long-range, there is no, also, so there is little in the pictures of the results. Just shiny pictures of things outgoing, setting off. Not all the media have shifted this way, but 24 hour news channels tend to take any coverage they can. The considered piece of journalism is now much less popular. Talking live has become the preferred method of delivery, particularly clear in some of the Middle East wars and some of the Middle East media, who have all pulled in their horns, to say the least, since the demise of the Arab Spring, and have almost given up going to front lines because their governments do not want to see who is involved and what is going on. So talking live at a distance and keeping to the feeling and the mood of the people is becoming the way of covering conflict. Sorry, folks, that's part of it. We have got to get in there and find out who is doing what to who. There are appalling difficulties that face any journalist. I do not envy people having to go in to conflicts today. Trying to operate, for example, where Islamic State is holding ground. It's horrifying. 
but there needs, needs to be more work to reinforce media that are strong, independent, reliable, and honest. Let's all work together on the problems of safety, accreditation, access, allegiance, bias, but let's do that from a base of integrity and confidence, challenging lies and propaganda publicly with well-founded facts and evidence. If we sometimes seem like the lone voices amongst the noise of other media sources, let's make it clear that we have the intention to report both the good and the bad news with honesty. We need to stand apart from the purveyors of fairy tales and the salesmen of propaganda. We need to be the news. Thank you. Thank you.